This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. If you've ever heard that a third temple will be rebuilt for the return of the Messiah, you are mistaken. That's right, there is no third temple, and there will not be a third temple until Yeshua's millennial reign. Maybe you find that shocking, maybe even consider that heresy, but it's true. However, something will be rebuilt. It's not a temple, but tonight, Michael Rood will explain exactly what that is during the final episode of A Brief History of Eternity. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live! Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live. We are again in quarantine, and uh, welcome to the final episode of A Brief History of Eternity. There is stuff tonight you have never heard before. I guarantee it, and you're about to hear it tonight. Michael, this is the final episode, and we have four more on the app. Uh, but tonight, you are talking about a third temple, or lack thereof. Tell us about this. Uh, that's right. Uh, so many people are filtering end-time Bible prophecy through the only source that, that really came out in the 60s, and that is the late great planet Earth by... How Lindsay. Who was that? <laughs> It was Al Lindsay. Lindsay. That, yes, sir. That's right. Okay, it's been, been so long. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in that he was uh, trying to interpret from the English scriptures. That's that's all he's reading. He, he He's not uh, conversant in, in Hebrew at all, but he is trying to understand the prophecy in Daniel. And so he interpreted that the Antichrist is going to make a land deal with Israel, and that starts the last seven years. I so remember everyone that. has been waiting for that. Everyone has been looking about that. They've been talking about this, and that is not what it is talking about. Not at all. All. It's not in the context of the entire book of Daniel. It's not in the context of, of the prophecies of Jeremiah and about Jeremiah hiding the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle of David. And when that is brought forth, as Jeremiah says, the cloud of glory will confirm the covenant. The cloud of glory will be seen above the mercy seat as it was in the days of Solomon and the days of Moses. So um, we are going to dig into this, uh, because it, this message needs to get out to the world, because people are living with a false expectation. Number one, that, that we could vanish any moment in a pre-tribulation rapture, which is absolutely against everything Yeshua said, everything he taught, every revelation that he gave to his prophets, it is dead against that. And so that's the first thing we've got to get out of the way, that there are legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah. And not only are there legal prerequisites, but part of that is the fulfillment of the prophets. The fulfillment of what Yeshua said, everything that is written about him in the prophets will be fulfilled. And the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David and the Ark of the Covenant coming forth, which is the testimony that God put in the earth of his son. And those who have not been following me for the last 20 years have no idea what we're really talking about there. But see, we, we the, the scriptures are one story from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. It is one story. And if we don't understand the prophets, and if we haven't rightly divided the word to be able to put the prophets in order and see how they are literally put in order by Yeshua in the book of Revelation, then we're going to have our minds scrambled by anyone that comes along with the new theory about the end times. See, and this is why I think it's so important to watch tonight, because when I first watch it, I mean, I get a preview of it after you record it, and we get to watch it and and put in the uh, the lower thirds, as they're called, at the bottom of the screen and all. So we get a preview of this thing, and I learned some things I have never heard you teach before uh, on this new series. So this is going to be exciting. Even if people have followed you for the last 20 years, they're going to get something new tonight, because I certainly did. 
You know, Scott, a lot of times I will say things, I will speak things, but I won't read the entire book the entire a scroll of the prophet Ezekiel that shows the background of this because I expect that other people are already reading this. And and if you don't read Ezekiel and, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, then you'll never be able to put these together. But, you know, this, this is why I keep teaching it over and over because uh, as I do it, the People have, uh, you know, spent a few more years in the Word, and now it's all coming together. The rivers of understanding are flowing together, and this is critical for this generation. It must be understood because this is the generation, I believe, we're going to see the confirmation of the covenant spoken by the prophet Daniel, spoken by Yeshua, spoken by Paul, spoken of John in the book of the Revelation, and I believe this is it. We need to understand how it's all going to come together. We need to re- read the instruction manual instead of just trying to piece it together ourselves. Now, by the way, there's a there's an image behind you on the TV screen. Uh, I believe that's an image of... Shavuot, this is it not? Is, Pentecost? This is Shavuot, the day of Pentecost. This is the pillar fire that came down uh, that appeared to the apostles on the Temple Mount, and this is where it happened, on the Temple Mount, on the day of Shavuot, with hundreds of thousands of people gathered together there at the command of the Almighty, because that's the day the Holy Spirit was poured out, and this is what we're heading into. I'm, I'm teaching this now. This is going to be our next series that we do on Shabbat Night Live, is the book of the Acts of the Jewish Apostles. This is the blindness in the blindness that has come upon the Gentiles that infuriates and provokes the Jews to jealousy. And every time I hear Gentiles teach the book of Acts, I get infuriated. I, I am protected because these are the Jewish apostles that got the good news of their Messiah out to the Gentile world. And then the Gentiles started polluting it with all their pagan sun god worship and, and non sense because they were never raised in the Torah. They don't know the prophets. They don't read this. And so we basically inherited the religion that came out of Rome, which is absolutely vapid, vapid concerning the understanding of the scriptures. You know, I think one of the, the key things to understanding the scriptures is to understand, you know, who Yeshua is. And, and more importantly, as you've brought out with the chronological gospels and everything else you've done over the last several years, is the chronology of not necessarily what he did. A lot of people know what he did, but it's when he did it. And that is where the calendar comes becomes so important. And I know you wanted to bring up Shavuot because that is coming up at the final day of this Gregorian month, May 31st, Sunday. That will be Shavuot, the end of 50 days. After, uh, and this after is what we're doing. Fruits. We are praying and fasting for uh, the establishment and, and bringing back the rule of law in America. And the rule of law in America is based on Torah law, based on God's commandments. And this is what is desperately needed. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I diverge for a moment on this, but, you know, when... Uh, when Trump was running for president, I would see the signs, make America great again. And every time I saw it, I said, America will never be great unless they come back to the commandments of God. A, a country that does not recognize the creator and creator given rights will never be great again. And I, and I thought that Trump was just a fraud because CNN was promoting him. And anything that I see on CNN, I know, I lived in Israel for years, we know that CNN could never tell the truth. They are a propaganda network, pure and simple. So when they started pumping Trump up, I thought he's got to be the biggest fraud on planet Earth. And then I started listening to what he was saying. And then understanding, as he has now established, you know, a day for the rule of law in America, and so we are now praying that that will, that will come to pass and that the corruption that will be exposed uh, in these uh, intelligence agencies. And I do have to put that in quote. All right. Well, you'll see that. Day. Don't get me started. Don't get me started because I, I, I've i got some stuff that I'm going to be releasing uh, this week, next week, uh, all during this period of time. I've got stuff that I'm coming out with that, that really it needs to be said. And now that I don't have to worry about networks and these Christian networks that, that, that don't want the truth being told, hey, I'm going to put it right out there because we've got our own app and people can go to michaelrood.tv, get the app and 
no holds barred, no time limit. This is the time. I'm finally set free from all this, <laughs> uh, from, from the monster I created, uh, network television, having to do that. All right, well, get the app. You'll, as Michael says, you'll get it all right there. It's no holds barred. MichaelRude.tv, you get the app there. You can get it for 14 days absolutely free and then decide what you want to do from there. So thank you, Michael. Now, coming up, we have the final episode, A Brief History of Eternity. And if you have not seen this month's new love gift, take a look. Here it is. All through the Bible, we are reminded that the almighty standard of holiness differs greatly from man's self-imposed rules, and that defilement is a matter of who you listen to. These are the commandments of God. You keep the commandments of God. Everything over here, these are the commandments of men. This is the plumb line. You don't keep the commandments of men. Michael Rood presents Defiled, an insider's look at why the turning of water into wine was so disastrous to the Pharisees' man-made rules. Defiled is filled with amazing detail and revelation you've never heard about the miracle of turning water into wine. But you won't see it on YouTube or anywhere else. The only way to see it is to accept it as our gift to say thank you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. We'll send you Defiled in your choice of DVD or Blu-ray when you send a love gift donation of $50 in the month of May. Or for a gift of $100, we'll send you Defiled plus a stunning Torah scroll shadow box. This beautiful wall hanging includes an elegant wood frame and a Torah scroll open to the book of Genesis. Plus, for the month of May only, you can receive another gift. For a love gift donation of $300, we'll send you the teaching, the shadow box Torah, and a stunning model of the Second Temple, the place where Yeshua taught the difference between God's laws and the rules of men. Act now. These wonderful gifts are available only in May. Get the teaching for a love gift donation of $50, the teaching and the shadow box Torah for a donation of $100, or get everything plus the stunning model of the Second Temple for a gift of $300. Act now. These gifts are available only in May. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or visit monthlylovegift.com. When the resurrected saints are gathered together on the sea of fire and glass for the 10 days of awe, the 10 days of inspection, and then getting dressed for the marriage supper of the Lamb, we wait to hear if our name is called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, into the Mishkan in heaven, where Yeshua will sit at the head of the table, where as John says, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of Yeshua, and he is sitting on it and we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this is when Yeshua's promise is finally fulfilled. He told his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, when he blessed the Most High with the prayer of the Melech Zadik, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem, Min Ares. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. I am your provision by my stripes, you will be healed. And then Yeshua, as he took his cup and he passed it around to his disciples, he said, I will not drink this again till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will take his cup and he will say again, this represented and still represents the renewing of the covenant, the covenant that offered to make you priests and kings I paid the death penalty. I paid the price for the broken covenant. And now, now you get to drink with me in my Father's kingdom. You are the ones that are going to live and reign with me upon the earth for a thousand years because I paid the price. Until the marriage supper of the Lamb, we do this in remembrance of him. Shabbat Shalom.
the chief rabbi of the state of Israel, the late Shlomo Gorn, said that the Ark of the Covenant was never lost. The Ark of the Covenant was deliberately hidden by Jeremiah in Mount Moriah, in the Temple Mount. Furthermore, he said that he had been in the chamber and he had seen it with his own eyes. Even though the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle of David seemed to have disappeared from the pages of Scripture, at the time that the 1611 King James Version of the Book of Maccabees was removed from the English Bible, it didn't really disappear. It is in the Gospel of John that we read John's record. John was a disciple of John the Baptist, or Yohanan ben Zachariah HaKohen. It was John the Baptist, or Yohanan ben Zachariah, that was the one that was told by the Almighty to call the people to repentance and to immerse them. Completely outside of the religious system of his day, he then went down to the Jordan River, and that is where he called the nation of Israel to repentance, to come back to the commandments in the Torah, to leave their paganism behind, to leave all of the things that they've added to the scripture and taken away from the scripture, the entire religious system, he then was calling them to repent from that and come back to the Torah of God. This says no one can add to and no one can subtract one single commandment that was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. In this call to repentance, he was then told, when you see the Holy Spirit come down and remain on one whom you immerse, he it is who will baptize immerse with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is the one that you're looking for. He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so, Yohanan was there with his disciples, Andrew and John. And it was the day after Yeshua walked out of the wilderness after his 40 days of fasting, and the 41st day in which he was tempted by Satan, and that day, Yohanan ben Zachariah, on Aviv 1, 27 of the Common Era, said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That was the first day of the first month of the year 27 of the Common Era. 483 years, or 69 sevens of years, from the day that we walked out of Babylon, crossing the Euphrates River, on the first day of the first month of the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, 457 before the Common Era. Now, 483 years later to the day, Yeshua walks out of the wilderness, and John says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That was 41 days after he had immersed Yeshua. And the spirit in the form of a dove came down and stayed upon him. And then John heard a voice from heaven and he said, the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John's disciples, Andrew and John, had heard him tell the story and had heard and maybe saw when Yeshua came out of the wilderness. But that following day, they are standing there with Yohanan and John, Yohanan, then says again, this is the one that I told you about. This is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And so John and Andrew came up to Yeshua and said, Master, where do you dwell? He said, come and see. Andrew would said, wait, just a minute, let me find my brother, Shimon. And so he found Shimon, which Yeshua immediately renamed him Kepha, because Yeshua already had a brother named Shimon, and so this was going to avoid any confusion, any ambiguity of which Shimon he was going to be speaking of. But it was there that we see that John, for the first time in hearing this whole story about This is what the Almighty had told Yohanan ben Zechariah. Upon whom you see the Holy Spirit come down and remain on him, he is the one that you're looking for. He is the one who will immerse with the Holy Spirit with fire. 
John never forgot those words. And he was one of Yeshua's closest disciples. As a matter of fact, when the time that Yeshua was hanging on the cross, it says that the other apostles were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Peter had already forsaken. He had already denied Yeshua. And John was there at the cross. That's when Yeshua said to Yohanan, behold, your mother, now my mother is now your mother. You take care of her. And he said to his mother Miriam, behold, your son, he's gonna take care of you in my place now. Yohanan stood there at the foot of the cross, seeing Yeshua as he agonized during those hours. Yeshua quoted the 22nd Psalm, which was a Psalm that, that David wrote, seeing the Messiah in his suffering beforehand. He was the one who wrote this Psalm, which detailed the crucifixion, detailed the agony, and also detailed at the end the victory that would be heralded throughout the world because of what happened on that very day. John, who's standing at the cross, saw Yeshua when the very hour was come that the last Passover lamb was being sacrificed on the Temple Mount. And the high priest made the final proclamation when the last lamb was sacrificed, which was the one he particularly chose. And the high priest would shout out, it is finished. John, standing at the foot of the cross at that very time, saw Yeshua, who knew that his hour was come, and with the very words of the high priest, they put a sponge to his mouth to wet his lips. He pulled up against those nails and pulled up one last time, filled his lungs with air, and cried out with his loud voice, it is finished. And John said, the earth quaked, the rocks broke open, and there were graves that were opened. He saw the earthquake. He stood there as the ground ripped open right at the foot of the cross where he was, right down in the roadbed. He could see the earth open up. And then, he watched as the soldiers came out. And one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced it into the side of Yeshua and out came blood and water. When John says this, he, for the first time in 19 chapters, he stops the entire narration. And he said, and I, John, saw it. I bear record. My record is true. I know what I'm saying, and I know that it's the truth. I know that it's right, and I'm telling you that you might believe. What did John see? What did John see when the earth quaked and the rocks rent and the ground split open? He saw the very Spirit of God in the form of a dove that Yohanan ben Zachariah had told him about the year earlier. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came off Yeshua and went down that earthquake crack, doves down below the earthquake crack more than 20 feet below the ground level. And he stood there and watched as Roman soldiers came out to kill the men who were hanging on the cross because they needed to get them off the cross and in the grave before sunset because at sundown began the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right now is the time that the Passover lambs were, 
were now finished being sacrificed and they were now being put in the ovens and they were gonna be taken out after the sunset and the lambs would be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. But at this time, when John sees this, sees the earthquake, the rocks rent, and the spirit in the form of a dove go down below. Now, they need to get those men off the cross. And so, Roman soldiers come out, and they take an iron bar, and walk up to the first one on the cross, swing the bar with all their might, and smashes his lower legs. That malefactor can no longer push up he has no strength left. That is his last breath, and his eyes glass over, and he's dead. The soldier walks up to the second one, smashes his legs, and he takes his dying breath. Then he walks up to Yeshua, gets ready to swing the bar, and he marvels that he appears to be dead already. And it could take up to a week to be tortured to death on, on the stake, on the cross. And so one of the soldiers took a spear and ran it up into his side. And out of his side came blood and water. And that is when John said, and I saw it. I saw this. I saw what happened. I am bearing record. My record is true. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying is the truth, and I'm telling you the truth so that you might know and believe. What did John see? He states in the 20th chapter, many of their signs truly did Yeshua in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book but these are written. I have written these that you might believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What did John see? In John's epistle, before he is given the revelation of the revelation of Yeshua, the Messiah, he says in 1 John chapter 5, there are three that bear record, bear witness in the earth. Now he is going to show us and tell us what he saw. There are three that bear witness in the earth. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. He saw the spirit come off Yeshua, go down that earthquake crack, and onto the mercy seat, which was buried in a stone sarcophagus over 20 feet below. The earthquake broke open the top of the case, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove then went down between the wings of the cherubim. And then the soldier, piercing his side, ripped it open, and outpoured blood and water. So now John tells us what he saw. There are three that bear witness in the earth. The spirit, the water, the blood, and these three agree in one. They are one testimony. If we have received the witness of men, the testimony of men, the testimony, the witness of God is greater than the witness of men. And that's how you and I believe, the witness of men. But the witness that God gave of his son is greater than the witness of men. And this is the witness which God has given of his son. This, the spirit, the water, and the blood. This is the testimony that God gave of his son. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. We don't have to see that witness. We don't have to see that witness because we have the unction of the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the witness in ourselves. That's why those who really believe can never deny him. But those who do deny him never knew him. 
They have, may have had a religion, they have mentally assented, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Because those that really believe, those who have confessed with their mouth, the Lord Yeshua, you are Lord, and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead, they are impregnated, they are given the seed of the Holy Spirit and they have the witness within themselves. He that does not believe this testimony that God has given of his son, God has made him a liar because he has not believed the record that God gave of his son. See, this is a record that is going to be brought forth to the world in the last days. This is a testimony of those who would love the truth and because there will be those who do not love the truth, God will send them a strong delusion then they might believe a lie. What is this lie? This is what we're going to see. And this is a record, John said, that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Yeshua's blood was shed upon the Ark of the Covenant. That is when we were bought and paid for. It was finished, it was complete. The blood of Yeshua was not spilled upon the same end of the Ark of the Covenant that the high priest sprinkled the blood of the lamb, the baby goat. That was on the right-hand side as he faced it. But on the left-hand side, as the high priest faced it, that is the right-hand throne of the, of God. The right-hand throne of the Ark of the Covenant. That is the right hand that Yeshua's blood was spilled upon that. And that is when you and I were bought and paid for. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul speaks of this, and he gets this by revelation, which he says that he gets this by the word of the Lord. He says, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and the truth of what Yeshua did, and his blood being spilled upon the Ark of the Covenant, because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. Because of this, God shall send them a strong delusion. The, God shall send them strong delusion. The word send is pempo, to send one home to where they're comfortable. God shall send them home to where they're comfortable with a strong delusion that they might believe the lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And when is this going to happen, that, that this will be revealed? When the tabernacle of David is rebuilt, when the Ark of the Covenant is revealed, when this testimony that God put in the earth is revealed, that is when the blindness in part that has happened to Israel will be removed. And when the blindness in part is gone, when they see and they look on him of whom they have pierced, that is what changes everything. That is not only what begins the last Shavuah, the last seven years, the confirmation of the covenant spoken by the prophet Daniel, but the confirmation of the covenant spoken by Jeremiah that the cloud of glory will be again seen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter two, Paul says, do not let any man deceive you by any means. For the day of Messiah coming to rescue us from the strain and pain of tribulation that day shall not come except first there come the rebellious stand and the man of sin is revealed, apocalypto. He's revealed as the son of destruction, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped 
so that he is God, as God, sits in the temple, no, the naos, not the temple, but the tabernacle. The naos, the tabernacle of David, showing himself that he is Yehovah. That is going to happen first. That is the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, spoken by Yeshua, and now Yeshua gives the same revelation to Paul. He says, the pain and strain and tribulation that you are now enduring, you believers in Thessalonica, this pain and strain will be immediately relieved when the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance. But that day is not going to happen except first there come the rebellious stand and the man of sin is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God so that he as God sits in the tabernacle of David upon the ark of the covenant declaring that he is Yehovah. And because they receive not the love of the truth, when the Ark of the Covenant is revealed, when they see the testimony that God gave of his son, the spirit, the water, and the blood, as the cloud of glory comes down on the day of atonement at the end of the 10-day war in which the destruction of Israel is a foregone conclusion. Joel says, before the invading army, it's like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, it's a smoldering, desolate wasteland. And the people are called to repent, the entire nation. And then Almighty God, Yehovah Tsevaot, fights for Israel. And that is when the double portion of the Spirit is poured out. And on the Day of Atonement, and this is what they're praying for. They are praying for the Almighty to deliver them. And then on the holiest day of the year, the day that has been reserved from time immemorial for the bringing forth of the Ark of the Covenant, for the confirmation of the covenant on the Day of Atonement, that is when Almighty not only fights for Israel, but the cloud of glory comes down and rests on the Ark of the Covenant between the wings of the cherub. That is when the covenant is confirmed. Paul says, now remember when I was with you, those three weeks in Thessalonica in which I barely made it out with my life with Barnabas and Timothy, you remember that? When I was with you, the only time that I was ever with you in Thessalonica, I told you all these things. This is basic foundational stuff. This is basic to those believers in Thessalonica, those who are raised in the, in the synagogue, who had memorized the scriptures, who had memorized and had read and studied the prophets, they could understand these things. They had, they had lived with the, the Torah their whole life and the prophets. And so he could explain all these things to them. He could explain and they understood that the tabernacle of David would be rebuilt, that the Messiah would sit upon the, the mercy seat and judge in righteousness. And they could understand this. A number of years ago, there was a group of people that went over to Jerusalem and they wanted to confirm that the ark had been found. They would not accept the word of either Ron Wyatt or Shlomo Gordon, the chief rabbi of the state of Israel, they just couldn't believe it. They just couldn't believe that truth. It was so far beyond them and they had to confirm it. And I met with them in Jerusalem and they told me what they were going to do and I told them, was sitting at the table with Ron Wyatt's widow, Mary Nell Wyatt, I said, I wouldn't touch this endeavor with a 10-foot pole. I said, he, Daniel, the angel told Daniel that he, he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant. He will confirm the covenant. 
It has nothing to do with the Antichrist making a land deal with Israel. No, it's the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant and the confirmation of the covenant, the cloud of glory over the mercy seat, and that as Jeremiah said, this must remain in this secret place until God confirms these things and the cloud of glory is seen. I said, it is not up to any man to do this. But they wouldn't hear it. They wanted to be famous. And that was the last time that Marinelle Wyatt even spoke to these people because she could not believe what they were about to do. They were about to bring forth the ark on their own ox cart. They were gonna do a new thing. They were going to be famous. They were gonna, whatever their intention was, it was destined to destruction. So, he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant. This is at the 10-day war. The war that starts, Joel's war, Zechariah's thermonuclear war, Ezekiel's war, the war in Isaiah in which two-thirds of the people in the land of Israel will be dead at it, at it, and then afterward, Israel, scattered all over the world, will be brought back into the land at that time. That war, which starts on Tishri 1, the day of trumpets, the 10 days of all, that 10 day war, and at, the, at that time, as Joel prophesied, that the leaders of Israel will call for a fast. And that fast is not complete until the day of atonement. And the Ark of the Covenant is revealed. This is the confirmation of the covenant. This is Yom Kippur, and this is when the last Shavuot begins. This is when the blindness in part to Israel ends. Then, five days later, the Feast of Tabernacles begins on the Temple Mount. This is not just the Feast of Tabernacles, this is the Feast of the Tabernacle of David being rebuilt on the Temple Mount with the 70 nations invited to it. And then, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles is the last great day. After the great war that culminates on Yom Kippur, with the confirmation of the covenant, then the Feast of Tabernacles will bring forth the Tabernacle of David from the stone chamber where it currently is and it will be rebuilt on the Temple Mount. There, the 70 nations will be invited, just as we were told by Moses that during the Feast of Tabernacles we sacrifice 70 bulls, which are the provision for the nations. And just as Amos said, and James backed him up, that the Gentiles, the nations, the heathen would come to Israel and they would be part of this rebuilding of the Tabernacle of David. They would see this very thing. Now the Ark of the Covenant really needs to stay where it is because that tells the whole story. The whole testimony which is in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, that which happened so that Israel will understand, so that they will look on him of whom they have pierced, and they will weep and mourn for him, and they will long for him, just as David and the, and the children of Israel long for the cloud of glory to be above the mercy seat again. They will long for him, they will want him to return, and they will long for him to rule the earth as he has promised and as the prophets have promised. So on the Temple Mount, the 70 nations assemble, and then on Hashanah Rabbah, on the last great day, that is when the double portion of the Holy Spirit, of which Joel speaks, and Yeshua also speaks of this. They that thirst, let them come unto me and drink, and out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. It is on that day the double portion of the Holy Spirit is poured out and that is the sealing of the 144,000 
Israelites, Israelites. They are not 144,000 Jews. All Jews may be Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. And so the 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel that proclaim the name of Yeshua Messiah and are sealed for divine protection then are sent out into the world just like Yeshua sent out the 70 and he worked with them until Hanukkah. So we have those who are sealed for divine protection a double portion of the Holy Spirit. But 42 months after this, there is a war in heaven. Satan, the devil, and his angels fight against Michael. And it says that Satan is cast out. He is, till then, is holding fast to his authority as the accuser before the throne, the accuser of the brethren. But, when Michael and his angels then dispossess Satan of his authority, cast him down to the earth, woe to the earth, because Satan knows he has but a short time. But salvation and glory has come in heaven because the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. So now, these last 42 months, this is when the abomination of desolation takes place. When he, the man of sin, who is inhabited by Hasatan himself, who is cast down out of heaven, who comes down knowing he has but a short time, goes to make war with the saints. The abomination of desolation is when the man of sin will then go and sit upon the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it would make sense for the Ark of the Covenant to be removed from where it is currently in that cave, in that stone chamber, and then brought up onto the Temple Mount into the Tabernacle of David because, as it says, don't let anyone deceive you by any means. That day will not come except first there come the rebellious stand and the man of sin is revealed, the son of destruction, the son of the destroyer himself who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God so that he as God sits in the naos, sits in the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle of David, declaring that he himself is Jehovah. And because there were those who did not want to receive the love of the truth, that Yeshua's blood was shed upon the Ark of the Covenant, that testimony that God gave of the Son, that is greater than the testimony of men, God will let them go home to their own delusion, their strong delusion, and they are going to believe the lie. They're gonna believe the lie that that one, that son of destruction, who is sitting on the tabernacle of God, declaring himself that he is God, God is going to allow that strong delusion. How could he sit there otherwise if God did not allow it? Uzzah. Uzzah just reached out to steady the ark, an act of of just trying to preserve the ark, and he was struck dead. So how can this son of Satan, how can he sit on the ark of the covenant declaring that he is God? Because God allows it. And God is going to send everyone a strong delusion that did not want to believe the truth. So, that is 42 months, three and a half years, a time, times and a half a time, 1260 days after the confirmation of the covenant. And then, during this period of time, this is when all hell breaks loose on planet Earth. This is the fifth trumpet. Then the sixth trumpet the sixth trumpet, and after the the sixth trumpet, then the seven thunders, of which John hears that which is spoken from the voice of that angel as he reads a scroll, and seven thunders roar out, and he begins to write down 
what the angel says, and then Yeshua shouts at him, stop, don't do this. I know I told you to write everything that must come to pass in the future because I want my servants to know this is something I don't want my servants to know. My grace is sufficient. I am able to keep them in the greatest trouble some time that has ever been from the beginning of time, never will be again. So I don't want you to write it. But what I can tell you to do, you take that little scroll and you eat that scroll. I'm gonna tell you up front that that scroll from which the angel read with these seven thunders that were uttered from his voice that I'm not going to allow you to tell the people, my people, what is in it. I'm gonna tell you that it's gonna be sweet to the taste It's gonna be so good, but it's gonna make you sick to your stomach. And so John did what he was told. He stopped writing, and then he took the scroll and he ate it. And it was sweet in his mouth. It was like honey. But then when he swallowed it, it made him nauseous. What is this communicating? He said, the moment that the seventh angel begins to sound its trumpet, the mystery of God will be executed. That is what is so sweet. You are almost home. Going through these seven thunders is going to make you sick. I'm not even gonna let you tell my servants what they're gonna go through because my grace is sufficient for them. I am going to be with them through this time. I am going to keep them in the time of trouble through everything they go through, whether they live or die. They're almost home. And then, the very next incident that happens is the seventh and the last trumpet sounds. When the two witnesses are called up before the throne in heaven, they give their witness of the visible sighting of the first sliver of the new moon, and then the high priest of heaven, Yeshua himself, says, sound the trumpet, and the trumpet sound, and the dead in Messiah are raised, incorruptible, We which are alive and remain, the mortal will put on immortality, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet Yeshua in the air. This is the day when he is revealed from heaven with the angels of his might and flaming fire taking vengeance and he gathers us to the sea of fire and glass. As we're in the sea of fire and glass, seven angels with the wrath of God in bowls of smoking wrath come out and they pour them one after another over the edge of the sea of fire and glass down to the inhabitants of the earth. And one of the angels comes out and says, no one, no one enters the Mishkan, the tabernacle in heaven until the bowls of wrath are poured out. But as the curtain goes back, as they come out, John sees and looks, and there it is. The Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. It has been raptured with the saints. They've been caught up together with the saints, but no one can enter until the bowls of wrath are poured out. When the last bowl of wrath is poured out, on Yom Kippur again, after the 10 days of awe on the sea of fire and glass, that is when the voice from the throne room shouts out again, it is finished. And then the innumerable multitude on the sea of fire and glass to wait to hear if their name is called, if their garments are white and spotless, if they have done what was required of them to be called by name into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And those who do so are called the bride, the bride of Messiah. At the end of that time, end of the Feast of Tabernacles on their last great day, Yeshua returns to the earth 
with the armies of heaven. Yehovah Tsevot, Yehovah of the commander of his armies comes back to live and reign on the earth for a thousand years as Satan is bound. And after those thousand years, the final resurrection, the final judgment. And those whose names are written in the book of life enter into New Jerusalem and the new heaven and earth. The curse is ended. And now, the entire new city is the throne. During the millennial reign, the Ark of the Covenant is the throne of Yeshua. But all of Jerusalem is the throne room. And we are invited to go up and minister with him as priest and kings. If we've taken the talents that we have in this life and we've done what he's asked us to do. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.